Again, I'm Bill Moylan, the Executive Vice President of Sales, and again, we're very pleased to have Jack Porco with us, who's going to talk about uh, some of the exciting things that he's done with Maximo and uh, Cyclo's mobile products. Uh, Jack is an innovator in the industry and, and doing a lot of things in terms of uh, putting the data in the proper format, uh, getting it into the hands of the mobile workers, uh, and I'm going to let him, I'm not, I'm not going to steal his thunder, I'll let him talk more about it when we get to that point. Um, so the agenda for today, uh, we're going to talk about mobile and what value it brings to your enterprise asset um, management system. We'll talk about Cyclo and what we do. We'll talk about the mobile platform advantage. So it's not only does mobile give you the opportunity to uh, bring your enterprise asset management system out to your workers, but allows you to use mobile across your organization, and that's what the platform gives you. We'll talk a lot about that. Uh, we'll go through a detailed study of what Jack has done. And then we'll go through a, a short demonstration by Michelle Joyce, who's also here with us today. We'll talk about some of the things we can do next to help you uh, get your feet a little more wet with mobile. And then we'll open it up for a question and answer session. Uh, and as we go throughout the presentation, uh, you can submit your questions via the Q&A section. And at the end of the session, uh, we'll, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. So feel free to put your Q&A questions throughout the presentation. Uh, you don't have to wait until the end. Uh, we'll capture those and we'll address those at the end. Okay? So without further ado, what, what is the, the attraction to mobile these days? And if you think about it, uh, mobile is being used by more people in more places. Uh, specifically for most of our customers, it's the ability to get the system into the hands of the people who are doing the work at the, what we call the point of performance. So if a te technician is out in the field, if he's out in a remote site, uh, if he's in a, inside a building uh, doing his work, what you want to have is have him have access to the information that he needs to do his job quickly and accurately. So if you look at this slide, what we talk about is mobile data capture means EAM success. So it's, you've invested quite a bit in your enterprise asset management system. What you want to do is have the information in that system that is going to help you make better decisions, have a full uh, view of your, um, your system and your operations, and then make better uh, decisions to, to enhance your business. So if we start out at the left um, and look at what it means to the technician and what it means to your organization, what we do is we enforce business processes. We do data, data validation at the point of performance. So a, a technician with a mobile device in his hand can select from a dropdown. So it, it makes him select data that you can uh, make decisions on. Um, it validates the information that he, if he types in something, it validates and makes sure it's in the proper format before it goes into the system. It also allows the technician to get a view of the asset that he's working on. If he's working on a piece of equipment and has had a history of problems, he'll know that before he starts doing the work so he can make better decisions on what repair needs to be made. So the technician is more knowledgeable about the equipment. Uh, the operations people back at the plant or back at the office have better information about what he's working on and allows you to get better information back and forth from the system. Um, it also allows you, if you move into the second uh, uh, rectangle there, is more data and better data. So a higher qu quantity of data because you're putting more in the system because you're getting it right there at the point of performance, uh, but it's higher quality because it's validated before it goes in. What that means is better planning uh, from, the, from the managers who need to do the planning and get the right people at the right place, at the right time, with the right tool to perform the proper procedure. Um, it allows you to do better scheduling uh, to, to optimize the routes or the places where your technicians need to be. But then finally, it gives you in more information to do better reporting on, to do better planned or preventive maintenance instead of corrective or out of, outage management. Um, the other thing it does is it captures and enforces the business process. So it gets all touches on all assets all the time. Uh, you know which parts are used on which equipment, which will reduce your inventory because you'll know uh, which parts fail more often so you can order the proper parts and keep those parts in stock versus parts that may sit there for a long time and never be used. It uh, gives you accurate information about failure codes so you can do predictive maintenance and determine where the problems may be in the future. Um, it allows you to update customer information more rapidly and more quickly so that you have the right phone numbers, the right customer information, uh, right there and right then without having to write it on a piece of paper. It gets lost, and all of a sudden when you're trying to contact the, the owner of that asset, uh, the business user, uh, you don't have that information. It allows you to get that information right away. And so what that means is that 
all the investment you made in your EAM system and all the processes that you tried to standardize, uh, putting it into one system and getting all that data, mobile allows you to reach that promise, achieve that promise of, of maintenance excellence. And uh, along the right side, there's four different areas uh, that, that we see in terms of benefits to our customers. One is increased productivity. The second is full visibility around your operations. The third is cost reductions. And finally, longer assets lives, which means less investment in equipment, more investment in your people. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of those um, for just a split second to give you an idea of what other customers have seen. Um, the first one is, is productivity increases. Um, if you look at the lower left, the little U.S. Army logo, uh, some of our customers are the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, the Smithsonian Institution, uh, the Congress, the Capitol Building, uh, a lot of key government in, in installations. And what the Army found was that they were able to reduce the processes and their steps from 13 down to 6. And what we've seen on average, if you look at the chart in the middle, uh, from talking to all of our customers, that we've seen the number of steps and in, in doing work orders go from 11 down to 4. Significant reduction in time, which ultimately means increased productivity for all the workers and all the back office people who support their workers. We've also seen that when a worker goes out to a site, he has the right tool and the right parts every time he goes out there. So he has the right piece of equipment, the right piece of um, equipment to put into that and the right tool to fix it. So he's not looking for parts or going back to the shop for parts. Uh, a lot of wasted time is now used to the fullest. Um, it also allows you to schedule and dispatch work more efficiently. And if we move on to the second one in terms of cost reductions, uh, what we've seen again from a couple of our customers, uh, data entry time cut by 50%. If you think of the process without mobile or with, with um, older type mobile applications, uh, a lot of re duplication of entry, writing it down, handing the piece of paper off. Well, with mobile, again, validated data gets entered in the right time at the first time. Uh, so they were able to cut their data entry time by 50%. Um, one of the top three uh, pharmaceutical companies in the world is a customer of ours. They, were, they did an analysis and figured that they reduced the cost from $4.90 to about $0.84 cents, uh, by using our mobile product. So, uh, and you look at all those different areas that they save money, that less time waiting, less time traveling, less time communicating with the head office because you didn't have to call or wait for a phone call. Information was updated to your mobile device automatically before you even leave your house or even leave the, the plant, depending on your environment. Um, again, a significant reduction in inventory and tool costs, uh, reduction in overhead time because you don't have to have that extra person handling the paperwork. Um, and again, better assets because now you're working on preventive maintenance versus corrective maintenance. You can make sure that you fix the machinery before it fails. So how do we do that? You know, what, what, who is Cyclo and, and how do we do, how, how are we able to accomplish those things? Now, I'm going to talk about that for a second before I go into the mobile platform advantage. Uh, the first thing was that we offer a broad set of solutions. It's not just for work order management. Um, that's the beginning, and that's where we've seen a lot of people start with work order management. Uh, but think about anything that a mobile worker can do, and we can help you talk about uh, that application. And there's quite a bit of, of different applications that are in use by our customers now. Things from planned or scheduled maintenance, like inspections, um, rounds, uh, all the way to outage management and emergency work orders that need to be handled uh, going from left to right, vehicle maintenance, a number of different applications. Um, and also, we have something, uh, we can do something called a composite application. So I think the majority of you here are on Maximo, but we also uh, connect into SAP, uh, to Tririga for facilities, uh, to Oracle. So no matter what the back end, we can help you automate that application and have all of those on a single device. So to give you a little more idea, uh, food for thought on, on different areas to think about. And, and we've been able to do that because we've been in this industry for a long time. We're approximately 15 years old. Uh, we have uh, what we call seasoned employees. I get called seasoned often. Um, what that means is that we've been here for a long time and, and we've either had experience in enterprise asset management or mobile, mobilizing enterprise asset management information systems. Um, we have an average of five over five years of experience uh, for each employee and our staff. A uh, significant number of customers, over 750 customers in over 29 different countries. Uh, so it's, we're global as well as, as local. Uh, so we're able to, to really help you out because we have a very vast amount of experience in mobilizing applications. 
And we've also had a very strong and long relationship with uh, first PSDI and then MRO and now IBM, who happen to be the same company by different names, uh, which also applies to our product. Uh, the same product by different names, but obviously enhanced uh, dramatically over the years. Uh, the, the term that we like to use, if it's not if it's not cyclo, it's not smart. And our products are, are branded under, under the smart name. Uh, but starting back in 1996 with IBM, with the smart products, uh, once IBM acquired MRO, we changed it to the IBM Maximo Mobile SE for SE standing for Cyclo Edition, which is the dramatically better and more uh, more functional, rich, functionally rich product. Uh, but with 400 joint customers with MRO slash IBM. Uh, it's also privately labeled by IBM under the smart name. And it's not just a, a product for IBM or for Maximo. What the mobile platform allows you to do is to build applications into any backend system, whether it's a simple SQL Server application all the way up through very complex ERP applications like SAP. Uh, we've connected into to both and everything in between. And what the, the mobile platform advantage is is that it gives you the ability to customize both the device, the information that's displayed on the device, and the connections into the backend system very easily. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, but, but the key with the Maximo system integration is that we really understand Maximo very well. We understand how to get our information into and how to get information out of Maximo to be displayed on the mobile device very quickly, very efficiently, uh, whether you're fully connected online via Wi-Fi, whether you're out in the field via cellular connection, whether you're in a remote environment via satellite, uh, or whether you're totally disconnected, we handle the information with the technician the same exact way. And we'll even switch over from network to network depending on what we call LCR, or least cost routing. Uh, so we'll take it from that Wi-Fi, which is the lowest, lowest cost in the building, to the cellular, which is a little bit more expensive but gives you more reach, uh, to satellite, which is really expensive but a lot more reach, to completely offline and having the same validation and the same information out to the technician. We also, when we connect into Maximo, uh, when we retrieve data from Maximo, uh, we're using SQL queries for speed and performance. But when we're putting information back into Maximo, we're using the Maximo business objects to get the full data validation uh, of the information that's going back in so that you're sure that it'll go back into Maximo properly without any errors. So it's a very thorough and very rigid uh, process that we go through. Um, and if, again, in this slide, if you move over to the right, we take care of all the devices, all the information that you need. So you build the application once, um, and all we need to do is to modify the screen a little bit depending on the device, whether it's a tablet, whether it's a uh, Windows mobile device, uh, whether it's a Panasonic Toughbook. Um, and we're also going to be announcing uh, support for some additional devices uh, in a very short time here. I'm not going to steal our thunder, but look, look at the Gartner wireless mobile conference coming up here in San Diego in April, and we'll be announcing some devices with additional devices coming out uh, shortly after that. So I'm not, I'm not going to uh, let the secret out, but we're working on some really exciting happenings over here at Cyclo. And, and what that means is that for your technicians and for your people on the field, it's very user-friendly and very usable. Uh, it's very interact interactive and intuitive, drop-down lists, we really walk the technician through his work process. He doesn't, it's not Maximo shrunk down to a smaller screen. It's walking him through what he does on a daily basis. Uh, we like to call it a day in the life uh, of, the, of the, the worker. Um, it's what does he do when he gets up in the morning? Well, he downloads his work orders. And what does he see? He sees a list of work orders and the, and the order that's either a priority or the work that needs to be performed. He can, and he can modify that depending on, on how he does his work. Um, all business rules are enforced on the device, and again, uh, whether it's online, offline, we handle all that for you so that your IT staff doesn't have to worry about it. Uh, we've also scaled into the thousands and thousands and thousands of users so that as you grow, uh, the system does not need to be upgraded. It will grow with you. And we also support a number of different peripherals, such as uh, cameras and scanners, and, and we've seen applications where people have taken pictures of equipment that's failed to, to store it in, back in, in Maximal so they can have a view of that. Uh, we have full integration to GPS and GIS uh, systems, so you can track where the work is being performed, you can track assets by location, uh, gives you a lot of stuff around location-based services that will really increase your uh, ability to perform your operations. And you can have simple things like handout printers on, on, a, on a worker's uh, belt, so you can print out a receipt uh, to give to the, the person uh, that he's done the work for. Uh, and from the IT side, 
uh, we really make it easy for you to support the application. Uh, and I know Jack's going to go into some of the things that, that he's done, which I think are really exciting, which are, I think will be valuable uh, to everybody on the phone. Uh, but it's very configurable with the Agentry Editor. Uh, we can do updates. We have mobile device management to allow you to update both the application and the device over the air. So if you need to do uh, the Windows Mobile updates, Windows Mobile updates, um, as well as application updates, the technician does not even need to know it's occurring. So from an IT perspective, you can sit back in, the, in, in your office, roll those updates out uh, with very little problems in the field. Uh, we're only transmitting net changes, so you're not doing a big download of information. You're just, you're just transmitting small amounts of data, which makes it much easier. Uh, we also have full security. Um, I mentioned a bunch of the military applications. We also have um, secret applications uh, that really need high security. Um, but we also give you a test environment to make sure that anything that you change is tested before it goes out. So at this time, to, I know you guys love to hear me talk, but I'm sure you're all here actually to hear Jack talk. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jack to talk about his experiences and, and the excellent things that he's done over at Bowman. Jack, well, thanks, Bill. I appreciate the uh, introduction. Everybody can hear me okay? Great. Um, we can hear you. Great. Uh, hello, everybody, and I'd like to thank Cyclo for allowing me to be part of uh, this presentation and share the story with you, and, and um, I hope that those listening will find this information useful and gain the knowledge of how, to, how our team made this mobile project a success for our customer. Uh, let me just go ahead and make sure I'm clicking in here correctly. Great. <clears throat> This project is all about refining the building maintenance program for Beaumont Services' uh, main customer, William Beaumont Hospital, in Royal Oak, Troy, and Gross Point, Michigan. We partnered with Cyclo to deliver the technology behind the product project. And I'm the uh, IT project manager, one of the IT project managers for William Beaumont Hospital. I've been with BSC and William Beaumont Hospital for more than 12 years, and uh, I've helped maintain their Maximo EAM for over six years now. This slide gives everyone a quick uh, perspective on the physical size of each main campus belonging to the hospital. And this doesn't even include the more than 70 off-site buildings BSC maintains. Uh, BSC is a department owned by William Bowen Hospital and is responsible for the maintenance of all of these buildings. They're made up of first response people, plumbers, electricians, painters, and fabricators, and more. Um, BSC also is responsible for uh, new construction as well as all biomedical asset ma uh, maintenance for the hospital. There lies the opportunity for the project. Our customer recognized that they had several issues with an existing legacy application that was critical to their Joint Commission accreditation. The application was a client-server web app that was prone to data corruption issues, lost transactions, and application downtime. So the customer asked, is it possible to move the legacy inspection app processes to our EAM so we can avoid another uh, RFI, and the definition of an RFI is a re requ uh, requirement for improvement, a citation uh, from the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations. Uh, because the, the, Senator, the Centers for Medicare and Medicare Services recognizes the Joint Commission's accreditation process, and Medicare and Medicaid account for about 30% of the hospital's revenue, we knew that this was going to be a, a highly visible project and something that we needed to do right away. Again, the application had no true application owner, limited vendor support, um, duplicate processes, which I'll get into, uh, inaccurate record keeping. So we had some really frustrated technicians that just needed a, a working solution. So from an IT perspective, the, the migrations were, were easy. We knew that we were going to be able to centralize the system maintenance administration. Um, while we consolidated all of our data processes and reporting, um, and we knew that we wanted to partner with um, a company that had strong integration with Maximo that, and that could scale well. And we knew that uh, Smart would, would be that company. So what you see here is kind of a project evolution timeline of what, what developed. Uh, we deployed our first phase of that inspection application uh, in March 2007 where we just simply moved the legacy processes into Maximo. We were at the time uh, running on uh, Maximo 411. And then phase two, uh, we recognized the, the need to have additional handheld functionality from the departments that were using it and uh, further data management enhancements. And then that year, we also uh, upgraded from 411 to 621. In phase three, we had another RFI uh, from a different department that was not using the mobile application. 
Um, and so it really tested the limits of what we had before, and they they wanted mu uh, many more dynamic uh, pieces to the application. So we, we began to build the framework to be reusable and scalable for all of our departments, and uh, really just encompassing every possible combination of all uh, pass-fail inspection types. As you can see there, we added an additional 15,000 assets for our fire alarm fire suppression system, which is in progress now. And phase four, uh, we are developing, or we are deploying uh, this month, and this is um, our, our big phase because uh, it kind of is the culmination of uh, taking that inspection application to its maturity and then also bringing in the corrective piece uh, for Maximo and making sure that we had um, a, a wireless way to connect to get the uh, corrective maintenance work orders um, as well as the uh, inspection work orders. And um, we had a, a, a multi-org, multi-site, um, for those that are familiar with Maximo, uh, and version six, uh, we had that uh, was part of the project as well, so that was kind of fun, getting all that done in one piece. Um, but essentially with this phase four, um, we've, we've now completed this work management system for our technicians, and they're able to support the, uh, the 70 plus offsite buildings that don't have any Wi-Fi connectivity. Now, our, our current project environment is Maximo 624, multi-organ site. Uh, we are on WebSphere and Oracle. Uh, just to give you a, kind of a, a size of the environment, uh, 40,000 mobile locations, uh, mobile measurements taken every month, and around 32,000 locations, and more than 120,000 assets that we manage on the handhelds. Um, from a reporting perspective, we, we have a solution from Business Objects. Uh, they're webby reports that are bursted every week that kind of tell the technicians what what's been done and what's uh, still yet to be done, and uh, there's a lot of custom business rules that we put in, into place as well that the, the reports are used as kind of a tool to to uh, help them manage um, all of their um, all their assets while in the field. Uh, on the Cycle Smart uh, Work Manager side, we're at version 44210 on the handheld as well. We have about 38 mobile devices deployed across three campuses. Uh, right now, we're using a, uh, a Mobi control agent for de remote device management. But again, this was uh, pre-Cyclo um, uh, MDM, I think it is. And uh, I think we're, we're definitely looking to uh, take out that piece for remote control and, and, and uh, put in the MDM, which we'll get into in a later slide. The de uh, deployed devices are what you see listed here. And on the next slide, you see um, just a kind of a picture of what what we did. Again, for the first three phases, we had uh, the MC50. And for this uh, fourth phase and beyond, we're using the MC75, which has the wireless wide area network. Uh, we're using the Verizon network, um, as well as the Dell Latitude 2100 with the VZW MiFi device. And this really was just there so that uh, we had a couple of technicians that have uh, manuals on DVDs that uh, they needed just more surface area to, um, to work with their manuals. And uh, that was their device of choice. The HPI pack we, we use uh, for um, the folks that don't need um, to be scanning assets and doing inspections, just the folks that need to get uh, their work orders and manage it right from uh, within the hospital campus. And then the MC55 will be the replacement for the MC50s this year as they kind of trickle out. Um, and again, for those that are familiar with Maximo, um, this is just a, a logical organization of the applications and how we tie them all together. It's it's really very much out of the box, but what you'll find here is that, um, we'll go, kind of go through this, we, we grouped our, and this, again, we started with for, version 411, so there was no concept of native roles in Maximo at the time. We created roles as uh, labor records and then grouped our PMs into logical uh, zones. and <clears throat> those PMs were then would, gen, would then generate into a work order where we would be doing multi-asset per work order in version 411, and this is this is before the multi-asset uh, feature even came out for Maximo 6. Um, another key piece was we used classifications, and that was really key when it came to um, creating these assets on the fly for the technicians. That way, they they couldn't get them wrong in the field, and uh, the, that really made everybody happy. Um, the the Data technicians would um, would then see these assets getting populated on the fly correctly, and, and again, not just the classification of the asset, but there's also a bunch of other as attributes that I'm going to show you as well that uh, we were able to download to the handheld and then sync back up. 
so the, this is how the um, this is how the basics looked on the handheld for phase one. And again, we what we try to do was capture the essence of the legacy app. And what the legacy app did really well was really quick inspections. It, it wasn't very dynamic. And again, it was pretty volatile, but it had very quick inspections. So we wanted to mimic that and, and make sure that we weren't putting anything that was going to be cumbersome for the techs, uh, more cumbersome from a process perspective. So all, all they had to do was log on, select a role, and then start a work order based on that role. Um, at this point, they would get a list of assets. This is the example of multi-asset per work order. They would select an asset to inspect, and they would get automatic prompts for failure points. So they would select whatever failed, and then instantly transmit, and then it would be instantly recorded into the condition monitoring app, and um, that was phase one. In phase two, we recognized that we needed to have on-the-fly asset location creation and uh, failure overrides. So this is an example. As a, so when you create, we're creating new locations on the fly, we give the guys the ability to do that. Was it the same as current floor, or was it a combination of building and what we call the Facilitech number, just a room number? And then the ability to scan in a new asset and then classify that asset. And you know, where did we want to send any kind of problem, uh, PFPMs, problem found in the field uh, work orders? So any, any issues, any failures in the, in the um, field could be sent to a default shop or to a different shop. And they had the, the choice to do that. And then they would transmit. <clears throat> phase three, again, if you uh, remember back, we had this um, kind of a larger phase that really, we really got more dynamic with the framework. And this could not now be used across every department. We added another classification level. And we added the ability to select other job plans based on the asset type. So we had um, asset awareness on the handheld when an asset barcode was scanned in the field, the handheld knew exactly what asset type that was. And it also knew that it, it, there were other uh, job plans that were associated with that asset. So they could override the default job plan and select a different job plan. And then there was other features like um, action-enabled job plan steps. If, they, if we wanted the technicians to actually retire an asset or a location, they could do that right there in the field. Um, as well as re, uh, reclassify an asset that maybe was classified incorrectly. And here's an example, and again, this is not an, ex an exhaustive list by any means. This is just an example of what we did with classifications in Maximo today for um, <clears throat> speaking strictly about um, inspections. So you can, you can see here, this is um, just a portion, but it gives you a, a rough idea of what, what we've been doing uh, thus far with inspections for the building maintenance program. In phase four, the work manager functionality uh, was for um, <clears throat> our multi-org environment. Again, it's a complete replacement tool for Maximo, so that's really what <clears throat> we wanted to make sure that everyone knew. Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. That it, it, it really is a challenge to make sure that those people that are used to doing something one way, um, that they now have this mobile device, <clears throat> that was one of the challenges to make sure that they understood that uh, they had this new tool that they can use. Um, fully functional Wi-Fi device uh, and wireless wide area network. And the consolidated inspection process. Uh, we were able to give these guys <clears throat> the ability to uh, combine their fixed and movable inspections. <clears throat> An example of that was most everything we have is fixed. A light, fire, <clears throat> fire door, excuse me. Voice is going on. Sorry about that. And the um, the only other devices that we had that were movable were uh, fire extinguishers. So we wanted to make sure they had a, a way to scan all these devices at, on one pass for a floor. We wouldn't want to have them make one pass and do their inspections of lights, for example, and then have to make another pass and do their inspections of um, fire extinguishers because the, the, the inspection behavior was so different that the handheld couldn't um, manage that, but now phase four allows us to do that same thing and do that very thing. <clears throat> and if you can uh, kind of focus here on, on the additional screens that we put in, <clears throat> this additional info screen allows uh, us to grab all the rest of the asset information that we want to pull down, and then they can manage that right there on the handheld. <clears throat> the two screens on the, on the uh, right side <clears throat> are for corrective work. 
And you can see this is just really uh, configuration specific. This is all the stuff that we want to make sure that they have captured uh, when they do new work. Uh, making sure that they have their correct requester information and which department did it go to, what type of uh, bill type it was, and so forth. <coughs> folks can hear me better. Sorry about that. Some of the key technical issues that we had, um, we wanted to make sure that our, uh, <clears throat> that we wanted to, we wanted to make sure that our uh, measurement table, for example, which was growing, uh, it really did grow now that we've been using it in 40,000 measurement points every month. Um, we had some uh, denormalization that we needed to do just by creating uh, simple views really did help the reporting process. <clears throat> The uh, DMZ, RMI port configuration, really well, all that's about is the fact that we have the cycle server in the DMZ. And uh, it was a tricky thing for us to do because uh, we wanted to make sure that we were secure and we, we didn't have the, uh, <clears throat> the Maximo RMI port configuration configured correctly. Just worth noting, if you're ever going to do uh, the cycle implementation in the DMZ, um, something worth noting. All right, classifications of data wherever possible. Um, again, it makes queries so much better, so much faster. It makes your, your fetches so much faster. <clears throat> I, I highly recommend doing this. Uh, but if you're going to be doing an, an, any type of inspection application, locations and asset classifications are almost mandatory. <clears throat> and one other thing to, to, to remember would be the uh, dynamic design. You definitely don't want to create hard-coded application um, values within the agentry editor. It, think about where you want to keep your data. <clears throat> From a maximal perspective, all of our data, all of our data configuration lives in Maximo. <clears throat> when you think about where it lives, the majority of it lives in our, our job plan records. So we can configure the behavior of it directly from the Maximo application, and that's what you want to be thinking. So our keys to success, you know, from from our perspective, it really was um, a perfect storm when it came to that legacy application. Uh, application. <clears throat> um, we knew that it was such an important application to our customer that uh, we could get this approved and really save some uh, save some dollars at the same time. So we migrated our core process. <clears throat> we added our additional business logic in. Uh, in, in every phase, as, as I was uh, describing to you, one of the but one of the biggest things uh, I think that we learned in this <clears throat> is that our support team had to be strong. Um, you, you have that mandatory system owner. Um, you have a data manager. <clears throat> From an IT IT perspective, you have to include the help desk. Um, From a and, and you need to have a power user at every. For us, it was every crew. Every single crew needed to have that one power user that they, that the rest of the crew could <clears throat> um, come back to. What also helps us, uh, we have regularly scheduled we, uh, biweekly maximal user group meetings. We really can make uh, quick and consistent uh, decisions across the organization. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and again, uh, make sure that when you're developing your phased rollout and your initial rollout, that the ROI really is based on the actual tasks. If you could job shadow with your with your customer, that's probably the best thing that you could do <clears throat> because a high level really gets you good detail from a, gets you the overall detail of, of the problem. But when it comes to designing that system, you really do want the, uh, the technician's perspective as well. <clears throat> and again, we, we document and we train and we reinforce this on a daily basis. Um, you know, we've been doing this, and again, the phase this this fourth phase is now underway. <clears throat> so we're in full support mode, and um, we just need every cylinder working to um, every every person to be on their game to to make sure that the application <clears throat> works 100%. <clears throat> Sorry. And then um, from our perspective, uh, what we found was. Um, 
user uh, acceptance testing was absolutely key. Um, you got to make sure that your customers are, are really part of the game, and um, and they have to commit to uh, uh, UAT timeframes and uh, acceptance. It's just uh, uh, I think something that everyone kind of knows. It's just a matter of uh, getting it done is the challenge. Okay, um, and looking ahead, uh, we have a few other things to do when it comes to inspections. <coughs> A few uh, changes to existing framework to do uh, measurements. <clears throat> There's a bunch of different uh, uh, inspection types that we still haven't uh, yet done, but if you can think of like uh, def defibrillators, um, isolation unit room, uh, inspection rooms, uh, isolation units, it's just the, uh, the application really is limitless. And then we're going to be doing some Maximo 7 agentry 5.x planning. Um, We'd like to start investigating what what it would take to move <clears throat> into a true multi-asset location per work order. I think that would really help our um, our queries simplify things greatly. <clears throat> and then do some native maximal role and uh, psycho device management as well. Wow, I I think I made it through that. I apologize for the uh, for the voice. Kind of gave out on me. Thanks, Jack. After you know, I do quite a bit of these myself, and I know when once you go down that path and your your throat gets dry, you can't. can't right, uh, right. So we're going to give you a few minutes uh, before the Q and A to to find some lozenges yeah. and get some more water. Will do. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Michelle. I think it's 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 you now. So for those of you on the phone, we're, we're going to Jack will be back in about ten minutes to answer questions. Uh, we're going to do a short demonstration with Michelle Joyce, who's one of our strategic AEs, uh, who will give you a short demonstration of of the product, and then again we'll come back. Uh, we're gathering all the questions, and we'll come back and, uh, and uh, put the Q&A session on for uh, Jack and Michelle and I. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Joyce. Thank you very much, Bill. And Jack, thank you very much for giving us an overview about your project and how um, you've had success so far. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a out-of-the-box demo. And this is Smart Work Manager for Maximo, and this is version 7. So just wanted to kind of give you an overview. We have Maximo uh, Work Manager for version four through seven. And so what you have to do is you have to make sure whatever version of Maximo you're on is the same version of Smart Work Manager. Just wanted to point that out to everybody. And what you are seeing on my screen is an emulator. It's, um, it's a product called Sodi from Pocket Controller. And the skin that I'm using is uh, a Motorola MC50. So it's a, Jack talked about this device. They, they have some in their deployment, and uh, we can talk about devices in the Q&A because I believe there were some questions that came in about devices. So what I'm going to do is give you a quick five-minute overview of the Work Manager application. I'm going to start off as I'm a day in the life of a technician. As Bill talked about the point of performance, I start my shift. I grab my device. I go ahead and uh, I authenticate into Maximo with my log on, and then I get my work orders for the day. So what I'm doing is I'm going to tap on the work orders menu, and as you can see, I'm assigned 17 work orders. As you see at the top corner, that I have 17 of 17 work orders assigned to me. And then I can see that the work order number, the types, and I can go ahead and sort these by types or sort them by priority based on just clicking on the top column. And I'm using a stylus to click is what I'm using. So what I want to do is, as I said, I want to do a very simple work order, too hot type of work order, and then we'll get into a preventive maintenance work order, and I'll go through the job plans and show you some of the things that Jack's doing in his environment. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to pull up a, a simple work order, as I talked about. And what I did is I highlighted that row, and it said that I received it on my screen. It's work order 1185, and I could see the description down at the bottom that it's too cold in Office 402. So what I want to do is I can go ahead and I'm going to start this work order. And by choosing my action button, I'm going to go ahead and hit start. And based on the workflow that uh, we configured for our customers, we can decide to have notification screens that make sure that I do want to start this work order. I go ahead and tap yes, and then it's going to give me the work order detail screen. And from here, I can see the details of this, my location, my asset, and so forth. So basically what it is is, okay, I probably just have to go and adjust the thermostat because, you know, this office, I know from just by 
being an experienced technician, I get called too hot, too cold every other day. So maybe it's more than that. Maybe I have to do some more research, and maybe it's a situation where I have to just replace this thermostat, which I'm going to do. So, again, simple work order based on what I know already, and then I've investigated in details, and, yeah, there's a faulty wire, so I'm going to go ahead and complete this. And based on my failure code reporting within Maximo that's integrated into the Smart Work Manager product, I'm going to go ahead and choose my uh, problem and cause code for this. Too hot, and I'm going to tap on my cause, and I'm going to say the thermostat, click OK, and then my remedy was I went ahead and I can, um, I have two choices based on what my problem was, and I replaced this thermostat. So I went ahead and click OK, and if I want to put any notes in there, so these notes would also be downloaded right into Maximo. I think one of the key things that mobile brings to the table, say you had two different technicians working on, on that room, one got the too hot and one got the too cold, this information is displayed to the current technician, so he knows that we just had another call that was too cold, so he can actually investigate whether it's a wiring problem or whether it's a simple too hot, too cold problem. And that's, again, the value that mobile brings you. Definitely, Bill, great point. Thank you very much. So if, again, next week, Bill has the work order for the same location, and he's going to see that I replaced the thermostat, and he may just tell the people to put a sweater on. So it could be as simple as that. Yep. So I'm going to go ahead and move forward, and I'm going to now charge my time to this work order. So it's also asked me if I want to do any additional work on this work order. So I'm going to go ahead and choose that and click on Next. And um, I can go ahead and create an additional follow-up, but I'm not going to do that. So what I want to do is just show you how I'm going to go ahead and charge time. So I'm going to go complete this. And I already did that. And then I'm going to go ahead and view my labor. And I'm going to go ahead and add my labor hours. And you can do this one of two ways. Within Smart Work Manager application, if you could see, it already charged two minutes, and two minutes has been the length of time that we've been talking about this work order where I started it. It's going to capture my start to hold, to transfer, what any status that I change in my work order is going to charge and collect that time. Or what I can do, and this is based on your configuration, the way that you want your people work in the field, I can go ahead and modify this and put in 30, 30 minutes. So I went ahead and charged 30 minutes of my time, and now I can go ahead and complete this work order. So this one is, I'm going to go ahead and close out of this, and what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about, we're going to go ahead and talk about the, um, the screens in more detail about this. And so what we're going to see is we're going to see detailed information about how we have the screen layouts and how you can go ahead and um, modify based on your configuration. So I'm going to go ahead and close out this screen and go back to my detailed work order list screen by clicking on home. And as you can see from my list, that one is now completed and there's a star beside it that is indicating to me that I have to transmit my work. So what I want to do in this situation is I can go ahead and transmit and as Bill said earlier, you can transmit, I can go back to a docking station, but not too many people do that anymore. Most of our customers take advantage of the wireless technology that's out there, and so I can just go ahead and transmit right from where I'm at, and I can pull any new work orders that I have for the day. So another great feature of this is working off and online. So now I'm heading down to the boiler room, and I know that there is no connectivity down there, so what I want to note to everybody is how that you would be offline. So what you have is the capability of working off and online within Smart Work Manager. By tapping on this little box here, you could see that I can work offline or online. In this situation, I'm online. So you have the flexibility no matter where you are. And a lot of times, if you don't need to be online all the time, saving your battery life of your device. So I'm going to go ahead and click out of there. And then also, as you can see, there's my transmit button. And then I can go ahead and transmit, but we're not going to transmit anything yet. And then also that action button. And then also you have your view. And then I can create a new work order right from here as well, too, a work order on the fly. 
So what I want to do now is show you how we can filter. Jack talked about how they filter a lot of information based on barcode scanning. But most of our customers do that, or you could just do a manual filter as well, too. So I already set up a filter based on location because, as I talked about, I'm going to the boiler room, and I just want to see all the work orders that are associated in this location. I have a PM, so I'm going to go ahead and let's take a look at this PM. So it is a condensate pump return, and it is for a centrifugal pump. So what I want to do is see the details of this. And one thing to note is all these hyperlinks on the work order details screen, I can go ahead and tap on and I can see the details of this asset, the location, if there was any components of this piece of equipment as well too. So if you need more information, all the hyperlinks will extend to other screens. So again, I'm gonna go ahead and start this work order. Yes, I wanna start this work order. And then also you can note any safety plans, any other pertinent information Maybe this, I need to wear protective clothing. Maybe I need to, you know, shut down power. So there's special steps that you need to take, and you need to track those based on maybe any regulations that you have within your organization. So, again, let's take a look at the job plans. One thing to note is Jack's job plans are, you know, very configured to his application to how Maximo is set up. This is out of the box, and we can do a lot of different things within your work orders and your job plans. So if there's any questions about that, we can base it on how you work today. So what I have here is I have a list of my tasks, and you can see down at the bottom in the description, it has check pump operation. I can mark these, or I can go ahead and just move forward through them. Based on the way your technicians work, you can create that they have to mark them to move on. So you can create rules and workflow based on how you want to work. Then I can go ahead and if I'm going to go ahead and open up one of these here so we can see the details. And this is replace a seal. And as you can see, I got some hyperlinks. I could do a reading if this was a reading. And um, also it's indicating, yes, that there's material. So I can go ahead and take a look at the materials associated to this. So as you can see, there's the seal that I need. So I can go ahead and, you know, start and grab my parts that I need for this work order. So let's go ahead and, you know, we're add, um, you know, the plan part. So now I'm going to go ahead and use that seal. And as you see, it already comes up with the item number and the description. And all I'm going to do is, you know, associate the bin. And if I'm using barcoding, I can just go ahead and scan the items for my uh, work order. I'm also going to say that I need two seals, and I'll go ahead and add a second seal to this, and I'll go ahead and move forward. And what you can see is there's my plan parts, and then on this other tab is my actual parts. So you can see that I only use the two seals for this work order. So basically, um, you know what, it's lunchtime, and it's time for me to go ahead and put this work order on hold. I still have a couple more things to do with it. So I can go ahead and put it on hold, but one thing to note is once I change the status, it's going to capture the time that I've already spent on these, um, you know, four or five steps. So from here, I'm going to go ahead and, you know, close out of this screen and close out of my job plans, and then I'm going to go ahead and charge my time. Go back to my detail screen, and I'm going to go ahead and put this on hold. And then you can have reasons why you're on hold. I'm going to lunch, or you know what, I'm waiting for parts, or that I need to transfer this to somebody else because I need a special skill to complete this because the majority of the times you're gonna have more than one craft on a work order. So I'm gonna to go to lunch, and then it's going to track charge those three, time, three minutes that I've already been on this work order. And that's fine with me. And so you can see the three minutes that have been associated to my, my uh, labor. So you can go ahead and I can close back out of here. And then when I go back to my, um, my home screen, you can see that this now is on hold. So I would go ahead and transmit this work order. And it's, I can, somebody else can pick it up or I can complete it when I come back. And there will be new work orders assigned to me probably once I come back from lunch after I do my synchronization. And that's a typical life of a day in the life of a technician that uses our mobile devices. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Bill Moylan so he can go ahead and do a Q&A and answer any other questions.
Thanks, Michelle. And one thing you can be certain of that when you come back from lunch, there will be many work orders waiting for you to complete. Uh, so uh, we're running a little short on time. I'm going to uh, finish up with a couple slides and we'll start the Q&A. Uh, for those of you who can't stay afterwards, uh, we will be recording the session. We'll be providing a PDF of the presentation materials um, as well as allowing you to uh, access the recorded session as well. So let's get back to the presentation to finish up before we start the Q&A. That's absolutely assuring. technical difficulties. I actually don't need to go back to the slides. Um, there are a couple things I wanted to point out. If you um, have any additional questions that we don't answer in the Q&A, uh, we do have a number of next steps. You can contact uh, someone from Cyclo. Uh, you can contact me at bill.moylan at cyclo.com, and I will put you in contact with the appropriate people. We can do a, a session where we understand your needs, your requirements around mobile, uh, talk about the best practices that others are using. Uh, we also have the Cycle Mobile Conference coming up uh, in July, July 14th to 16th in Chicago. And for those of you who have not spent any time in Chicago in the summer, it's a great place to be. It's going to be held downtown Chicago uh, at the Swiss Hotel right on the lakefront uh, with a lot of activities around that. But uh, some of the key things that we're going to have is our very popular uh, the expert session. Uh, we can bring in your questions and talk to you know our developers, our experts, our consultants uh, to get answers about your de specific deployment. Uh, we're also going to have technical tracks uh, for those of you who want to find out more about configuration, as well as business tracks for those of you who want to find out uh, different ways to implement the functionality and help you with, with planning your implementation, managing uh, the cost savings ideas that you have, and, and general problem solving that um, you have. So let us know if you're interested in that. And actually, I think we've got the slideshow back now. And if I go to one more, this is the Cyclo Mobile Conference. Uh, if you go to the web, it's smc.cyclo.com to learn more about it. Uh, registration is now open. If you if you uh, register early, you get a savings. And then also the um, this is the final slide for the for the toll-free phone number to call in or requesting info is info at cyclo.com. So at this time, I'd like to bring Jack back in. Jack, are you still on? Hello? Hello, Jack. And yep. we're going to turn over to our questions and answers. Joe Granda, our VP of Marketing, has been uh, collecting the questions, so uh, I'm going to let Joe feed us the questions feed to both you, Jack, uh, and I, and Michelle. Great. All right, Jack, I've got, I've got a few questions here for you. To, uh, we'll start off with those. Sure. Uh, sure. The first one is why did the project start with maximum 4.1.17? I think I know the answer, but I'll let you answer that. Why did the project start with 411, maximum 411? Yes. Okay. Well, that was the environment that we were on, and um, we started the project back <clears throat> again, and uh, we started planning the project back in, Mac, uh, in 2006, so late 2006. That was the environment we were on, and we... we we took that amount of time to really migrate to uh, version 6.2.1, so it, it took us. We we actually had at one point, um, if you want to know the history, uh, we were planning an upgrade to version 5, and we had um, chose not to move that route. We were having a lot of uh, performance issues, and uh, um, and we just chose to stay on ver version 4.1.1, and uh, it really was slick um, the way that it was set up. So we were really happy with it, and. Um, and just it was just really timing is, is really what it boiled down to. All right, I've got another question for you. I like this question, Jack. Mm -hmm. um, please discuss the mobile hardware device selection. Were technicians involved in the selection and the UAT? Yeah, we we had the devices. We had our eye on the devices, I guess, uh, for a while. Now going back three years that we, um, now four years that we uh, were planning and starting this, there was really, <clears throat> there wasn't a, a whole heck of a lot for us to choose from um, that we, we felt was in the price range that we could afford. Um, I think price drove a lot of it as well. And when we looked at the, um, 
the top end uh, devices, we we weren't going to be able to afford that for the project. Uh, so we we try to get something a little bit more in in that median price range that was still hardened, not ruggedized, but hardened, and that could withstand a couple of you know a couple of foot fall, um, and that uh, wasn't going to break the bank at the same time. Um, so we we uh, worked with. Uh, again, this was really for a couple of crews that we started with originally at, at one of the campuses. So we worked closely with them, and they, they <clears throat> and we told them what their choices were. <laughs> kind of forced them into it, really. But but they did the testing. We had one device, and they did the testing on the device, and they were happy with it. Uh, so really, it, was, it came down to a couple of factors. It was, you know, we knew that there were the Cadillac solutions out there, but we just really weren't going to be able to afford those. So we we wanted to get back into. Uh, kind of a median price range, and the, we found that the best bang for the buck at the time was the MC50. Uh, and now there's just there's a lot more options, and we like uh, uh, they, they've been really dependable, and we do like um, the, Mo the Motorola line. Um, and uh, those guys are now. I mean, it's not something that we're we're married to, but we, they they definitely do like it from a um, hardened device perspective. And the MC75 uh, is really just a from our perspective, we we found that it's just a uh, manages memory much better, uh, the battery life much better, um, the uh, scanning engine is, is great, uh, as was the MC50, um, but but that was a real, uh, you know, the, that was a debate, you know, do you go with a, a device that um, is one of the ch El Cheapos that you throw away once it drops, you know, uh, or do you try and go with one of those mid-range ones and make it last as long as it can, and that's, that's what we did. Excellent, excellent. Well, the nice thing is you have the flexibility to use a, a number of different devices with, with us. I've got a few questions that are like softballs that I can answer really quickly. We're running out of time. But one of the questions was, are there different versions of Cyclone Mobile for different versions of Maximo? Great question from the audience. Um, the answer is yes. We work with four, versions 4, 5, 6, and 7. Um, the next, another question. By the way, to, to please go a little bit further on that question, uh, there are upgrades from each of those. So if you start with a uh, smart work manager for 411, you can upgrade 25, 26, 27. Uh, we have a methodology for uh, upgrading you along with that path. Perfect, perfect. Because you, as you heard, Jack, he went through that upgrade process. Yep. Um, another one is, uh, is the mobile platform the same for mobile inventory management? And that's the beauty of our solution. The answer is yes. They're all based off of the Agentry mobile platform. So work manager, inventory manager, auditor, all of those are based off of the same powerful platform. Here's another question. Which Cyclo program adds assets, auditor or work manager? Okay, so Jack talked about work manager today. We also offer another solution called auditor, and that is the solution that you can go around and add assets. Okay. If you're if you're rolling out a new maximum implementation and you need to get assets into the system quickly, Auditor is the product that will help you do that. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I'm going to take one more question because we're out of time here. We've got a lot of questions, by the way, everybody. So thank you so much, and don't hesitate to keep asking the questions. You've got the email info at cyclo.com, so don't don't wait to don't hesitate to send them in. But here's the last question. This was a Jack question here, sure. okay? Um, what resources did you have for barcoding 120,000 assets? It's a lot of assets, Jack. How, how did you do it? Yeah, um, we can speak to that on the third phase as an example. Um, uh, what we did was a hybrid approach. Um, we had these guys, because we didn't have the product auditor, uh, and we stuck with what we had from a, a work manager perspective. We had the guys do their initial inspections the way that they were doing them, and that was on paper. And the, the paper or the uh, the paper that was then translated to a spreadsheet, and that spreadsheet was given to the data technicians to key in by way of the 32-bit agentry software, um, <clears throat> the Win32 software. That wasn't pictured here, but essentially it's uh, it's the non handheld version it, it just is installed on any desktop and so they keyed all that in um, and we have the, the you know the documentation to prove you know it was handed off and then then sent in, up into cyclo uh, up into maximal by way of uh, the 32-bit platform um, 
and when we found that that was just the easiest way to do it, that was the initial um, inspection for that zone. And then the second time around, when the when the inspections came up for that zone again, those assets were then in Maximo. So that was, yeah, it's a good question because logistically it's it's tough, and um, and it, it without auditor, and I haven't really used auditor, but without an application that really makes it easy for the technician to type in all the long description or or even a short description, it really would make it tough. And and we just decided to say, at at every interval that was due. We, we broke it up into that um, process where they did their normal inspections. We then translated it into Maximo. There's several different ways you can handle it, but that's that's the way we did it. Okay, I've got I've got one. I've got a. I, we're going to take a few more questions because there's just so many of them. I got one I thought was a really neat one here. Um, any problems or data breach over Wi-Fi? You know, and as as uh, Michelle mentioned, people use Wi-Fi all the time. Uh, the answer is. Not really. Um, the whole idea with mobility is that you can work online or disconnected or sometimes connected. And so we'll work with Wi-Fi, WiMAX, cellular, all of those things. And the, the key issue here is, is data breach. That was the buzzword that I heard. And what we do is we work with, with uh, federal agencies and, and, the, and the like, and they're so ultra-concerned about data breaches that we have to make sure that our systems are are compliant and are safe, and what we do is we do encryption over the air to eliminate any kind of issues when it comes to the breach, data breaches when we're using Wi-Fi. So it's a great question, um, and we've answered that question with with the solution with our solution. Yeah, through full authentication to get into the to the device, as well as 128-bit SSL encryption um, over the air, as well as with the mobile device management. If someone ever loses a device, we can do a remote wipe of that device. So it gives you a lot of flexibility around your security, uh, your authentication, and again, ability to uh, disable a device. Chuck, I've got one other question, and I am going to call this the last question. Can you explain the DMZ, the, the, that DMZ that's in the background there that you talked about in one of the phases? It was one of the issues. Yeah. Can you explain that for our audience, please? Sure. And yeah, now that I have my voice back, I will. Um, <laughs> the uh, the DMZ is essentially, as, as other network folks know, is a demilitarized zone, which is a secure zone uh, of any any um, firewalled network. And what we did was we put the Cyclo server in that network. And why did we do that? Because on this fourth phase, we had devices that were going to be outside on the public network that needed to communicate to the Cyclo server. And there was no way, based on HIPAA regulations and anything else, that we were ever going to let them pass through um, without some kind of encryption, or, or, or at least into a demilitarized zone. Now, we, we aren't <clears throat> on those handhelds themselves. Um, we don't carry any patient data, uh, so there's really no HIPAA regulations that from that way, but we, we don't want to be that weak link in, in the hospital's uh, security infrastructure. So um, we do not encrypt. Okay, we, We're not using the cyclo encryption, so we're, we're, that was our decision to put that into the, um, the DMZ was to put that cyclo server into the secured area of the uh, hospital network. It then uh, has fire, direct firewall ports that are and specific firewall ports that are open from the outside in and then from that DMZ into the internal network. And that, that provides the security that, that the hospital needs. All right, guys. I really appreciate everyone's time. Um, Jack, I, I want to appreciate, uh, thank you again for all your time. I know this is a lot of work to prepare, but I think it's very valuable to all the people who attended as well as to us. So thank you very much for, for your help here. No uh, we're we're going to collect all the questions. Uh, for those of you, again, on the call, feel free to send questions in to info at cyclo.com. We'll answer every single one of them. Um, for those, uh, Jack, if you don't mind, I'll send over if there's any additional questions to you uh, when you have time to answer. Absolutely. Uh, I appreciate everybody's time on the call. Uh, we're here to help you, and uh, let us know how we can do that. All right, everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.